the Fleming College and the learning opportunities at the Halberton School of Art and Design. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Fleming College sits on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Mississauga peoples. We offer our gratitude to our First Nations for their care for our earth and our relations. My name is Shelley Shell and I'll be your host and moderator. I coordinate Halliburton School of Art and Design part-time programming. This session is being recorded for reference and we'll continue to welcome your questions afterward. Details will be provided at the end. I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists here to assist with a range of questions. Bailey Robinson is from our admissions department where the goal is to support students as much as possible from the application process through to working closely with the student accounts and financial aid teams to ensure students know about tuition fees and can work through the OSAP application process. Wendy Laderante is in student services at the Halliburton campus, supporting students with program information, assisting with the admissions process and connecting to any support services required. A graduate of Sheridan College, I'm sure it would have been Fleming if we'd had full-time studies at the time. She's also an artist. Is a professor in integrated design, a diploma that program that he created for the Halliburton School of Art and Design six years ago. It was through this program that the Center for Making, located on campus, was established. Barr also coordinates the digital image design and moving image design certificate programs. He holds a BFA from UBC in Vancouver and a Master of Design from OCADU in Toronto. He's been a practicing professional graphic and environmental graphic designer since 1996. Angela Stucater is the Dean of the Halliburton School of Art and Design. She arrived in January 2020 and has been working hard with the team to transition art and design education into viable and exciting online programs. A champion of the Fleming Safe campaign, Angela is committed to ensuring quality education through alternative delivery and face-to-face -face studio practice. And I'll turn it over to Angela now for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Shelley. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this online session. Of course, my preference would have been to have met you at the doors of Fleming College. None of us could have predicted the strange times that we find ourselves in. COVID-19 has required us to make some significant changes to things we have always taken for granted. And more recently, we've all been affected by the social unrest south of the border. Despite the turbulent and uncertain times, there's hope for optimism, and there's a huge opportunity for us to shape the new normal. As aspiring artists, designers, craftspeople, and conservationists, you will be learning tools and techniques to shape our future. We are so excited to have you on board for an educational journey, which we know will be rich, challenging, and very rewarding. So on behalf of the Halliburton School of Art and Design, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to welcoming you in fall of this year. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Angela. And of course, that raises a good question in, around what will the full programming look like? And perhaps you and Barr could uh, provide some information in that regard. Sure. So we have been working very steadily um, in the spring and will continue in the summer to develop seven weeks of online learning for all of our programs here in Halliburton and also in Peterborough. And the idea here is to be respectful of a campaign for uh, Fleming, Fleming Safe, which is basically an effort on on the part of all participants in the share in the Fleming community to share the responsibility to make sure that we are safe individually and as a community of learners. So to that end, we are taking a number of different approaches to what online learning will be. And that involves everything from demonstrations, critiques, groups getting together in workrooms, in studio-like settings, providing materials for you to work at home and sharing them with your fellow students and your instructors, professors, artists, and guests 
who will be providing you with the education that we have become renowned for. There will be a lot of opportunity for feedback in this process as we learn with you the best way in which to provide rich, um, engaging, dynamic, and uh, fulfilling education uh, in a time where all of the possibilities are there and it's a matter of us shaping them for the best experience. One of the key things that I think you need to know as incoming students is that there is a team behind you from administrators to staff to the faculty. The faculty are made up of both contract faculty and full-time faculty. And there's one person in particular that will be absolutely instrumental to your learning experience. And that's the coordinator of your particular program. The coordinator is the person who oversees the look, the feel, and the experience of your education. And to that end, I'd like to pass on, it on to Barr Gilmore to talk about his role as coordinator of the integrated design program and to give you a sense of what that role means to you as you enter into post-secondary education. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'm Barr Gilmore. Welcome to this Ask Us Anything session. Um, I just want to start off by saying how lucky we are um, to be up in Halliburton at this time. It's, um, it's probably the most beautiful place on earth. <laughs> and um, I, we really do feel the best of it. Um, and the Halliburton campus um, is very special. Um, and we pride ourselves on our experiential learning, uh, meaning that, you know, yes, it's the hands on experience that gives value to our campus uh, and the reflective learning that goes along with that. Um, but it's so essential that we don't lose sight of that um, in this ever-growing digital world. Uh, in fact, uh, when I first came to the Halliburton campus about six years ago uh, to establish the Integrated Design Diploma Program, what drew me to this campus uh, was the big open studio spaces with people making things with their hands. In a digital environment to the campus, we wanted to make sure that we created a synchronous environment between the handmade, the machine made, and what I call the otherworldly, or you know, that intangible something something um, that connects us to the rest of the universe. I think that we've accomplished that here at the Halliburton campus. Um, and our history of old hippie craft school from the 60s. Uh, makes me think that we will become the Black Mountain College of the 21st century. And if you don't know about Black Mountain Colleges, Google it. <laughs> uh, but let's start by um, uh, thinking about the computer as just another tool in our tool belt with the same significance that we give to the paintbrush, uh, the ceramics wheel, or the metal forge. Um, it's really the creative and conceptual thinking and self-knowledge that we bring to our mediums. Um, that bring them to life. So what, what does digital learning look like in the first seven weeks of a school that's used to getting their hands dirty? Um, well, it'll be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. And um, what is synchronous learning? Well, synchronous learning is when we're all on WebEx like this. and um, myself or um, our other faculty are delivering lectures to you. So it's about listening um, um, and it's about um, discussion. So, you know, like having open discussions online about concepts or ideas. Um, it's also the guided critiques because you are going to be making things in the first seven weeks. And so we need to sort of have a way of looking at them. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about um, materials that you might need and you know a camera on your computer is obviously one of them so that we can see what you're making uh, but we will have online critiques 
and discuss the same way we would in the classroom. Um, and you will be, you know, uh, listening um, intently, I hope, uh, to the lectures that we're delivering as well. Uh, what is asynchronous learning? Well, if synchronous is online and we're all together in the same, you know, web room, um, asynchronous is like offline learning. So, so that would be any sort of activities like reading short art articles or watching relevant uh, YouTube or TED Talk videos. Obviously, in a classroom, you can't be like streaming video to everybody because you're not going to get it. So um, it would be more about sort of like watching a video or reading an article before a class and then being able to talk about it in a discussion in a meaningful way. Um, synchronous learning um, in a studio context would also be about, you know, practicing your techniques. You know, like you might be taught how to draw something um, and it would be offline, you would practice those techniques. Um, it would also be about doing research. It would also be about actively exploring uh, or working on your assignment. Um, but it also includes things like uh, taking quizzes. Uh, in integrated design, for instance, um, it's all our quizzes are open book. I don't believe in um, having to memorize things. Um, I think if you learn things, they're sort of embedded in your head. And I, I believe that you know, anybody can use Google or, you know, whatever you use to uh, get information to answer questions. Um, we'll also be recording all of the lectures. So uh, if you if you happen to miss a lecture or fall asleep in a lecture, um, uh, the recording will be uh, available to you um, uh, by email afterwards or online afterwards. So you can, you can rewatch the lecture um, to get points or whatever. Um, so yeah, so we, we sort of do three different types of activities, which would be absorbing, doing, um, and what's the third one? Uh, absorbing, doing, and connecting. So, so absorbing would be about the listening, reading, watching videos. Uh, doing would be practicing um, activities, games, case studies, research. Um, actively exploring, testing your assumptions, uh, and connecting would be when we all get together in a synchronous way um, to discuss issues or concepts or do critiques. Um, but yeah, so it, it's it, it'll be different from a face-to-face -face experience where we can sort of um, listen to each other, um, um, like read body language, you know, like. The, the nuances of face-to-face -face are lost online, but we'll try our best to um, make it a good experience for everybody. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Barr, I think that's excellent. In the event that uh, we are able to shift from the, uh, the online instruction to face-to-face -face and, and be able to welcome people to the campus and be in class, um, people wonder what housing options um, are available and how that should be handled. And I wonder if Angela and Wendy could help us with that. So I'll start off by saying um, that in Halliburton, the housing opportunities are mainly the accommodations available in shared houses, apartments, and the like. Uh, there is something incredibly wonderful about being here in this community of Halliburton. Um, as Shelley mentioned, I moved here in December or in January of 2020, so in the dead of winter. And you would think that would be a hard move, but in fact it was fantastic because the weather and the um the, the landscape around here is just magically beautiful. The community is warm and supportive and the school is at the heart of that community. So I encourage people to think about moving to Halliburton even in uh, September, if that is an opportunity or an option for you um, and working online for those seven weeks, but getting a sense of what it's like to, to live here. Um, as for folks in Peterborough, 
in the museum's program and the graphic design program, that the opportunity there is again to live off uh, site. There is some uh, discussion, obviously, around residents and how residents will work um, come fall for the uh, new cohort. And so stay tuned on developments um, in the residents um, there. And um, we will be happy to answer all the questions we can based on best practices of Fleming safe and also aligned with what the um, Ministry of Health uh, directs us towards. And I think Wendy can add a lot um, to my dis description of life in Halliburton and in Peterborough. Everybody, um, our landlords are used to short um, term rentals. Um, so don't hesitate when you're reaching out to them to say, I'm gonna spend the first month at home, but then I want to come to Halliburton. Can I rent for three months or can I rent for a shorter period of time? So um, they're aware of the situation and so you can connect with them. Your contract is between you and the landlord. So you need to be asking questions about if you were coming early, if um, they have good internet service or if you have to bring a hot stock stick or whatever those things are called. Um, and to find your listing, go on to the Fleming webpage on, on Student Life tab and you'll find housing. Go to the off-campus, Halliburton, and the fall, winter, spring. And you'll, you'll see a number of listings there that will give you an idea of how far away they are, if you need a car. Most of our students walk or ride bikes to school here. Um, and what other kind of amenities? So is it, uh, would you be by yourself or would you have a couple of other people in the house with you? So you need to ask those questions. If you're stuck, if you can't find the link, if you have a question about how far would that actually be, don't hesitate to contact us because we're here to help. Wonderful, thanks very much, Wendy. I think in the times that we're in right now, there are many uh, students who have applied who are wondering about deferring. And uh, Bailey, if you could provide some information about deferrals, we'd be grateful. Absolutely. So to request a deferral of your program, that isn't something that's been traditionally offered by Fleming College. We are prepared to welcome students in the fall in alternative delivery formats. And we have dedicated a lot of time, as you heard both Barr and Angela speak to, um, into planning seamless delivery for students and ensuring that learning outcomes are not compromised. In the event that you're not interested or no longer interested in joining us this fall, we are happy to consider applications for the next intake. That does require you to reapply through the Ontario College Application Service, that's OCAS. Um, the same way you did this week uh, for this year. This could result in an increase in the waitlisted program. So if we have a lot of students deferring this year and we have an equally high number of students who want to attend for 2021, it may make it a little bit tougher to be admitted next year, but we are more than happy to accept our applications for next year and we'll do as best as we can to accommodate everyone. Great, thank you, Bailey. We are approaching some financial deadlines. Bailey, could you uh, talk to us please about tuition payment deadlines? So this year for the fall 2020 term, um, which starts on September 8th, there's a non-refundable and non-transferable deposit that's been lowered this year. So that deposit is going to be $250 and it's due on June 15th. So unfortunately, if you don't pay your deposit by June 15th, we may not be able to guarantee your seat in the program. So I will stress that that deposit deadline is important. Um, the tuition fees are not going to be reduced for fall 2020 because the learning outcomes and the curriculum expectations are remaining the same. So in other words, your learning outcomes will not be compromised this year. The delivery schedule will be adjusted to accommodate social distancing protocols um, because of COVID-19 and we want to make sure that everyone is safe and well. There are courses that rely on practicums and applied projects and the schedules for those programs will be adjusted to meet those course requirements and they may be offered later in the semester instead of earlier. 
Adjustments will also be made for some of the programs to allow for smaller group sizes once we return to campuses so that you can start with your labs or your practical elements a little bit earlier, but in smaller groups. Thank you very much. Well, school is always about more than books and labs, et cetera. Uh, question being, will there be sports and recreation opportunities in the fall? And I think Wendy and Bailey will be best able to help us with that one. So for the Halliburton area, um, you will discover lots of walking and hiking and biking trails, um, very much uh, um, do it on your own or do it with um, a group of friends. Um, and of note, the Forest Sculpture Trail is very close to our campus and it's filled with wonderful sculptures. And it's like, um, it's like taking this, this walk and discovering something new around every bend. So once you're here, I hope you take advantage of that. There's also other facilities um, in the community. There's um, for people who like to skateboard, there's a skateboard park, um, there's lots of things here. And we'll be sending you information on that in the future. And speaking to the Peterborough campus, for those of you who are studying graphic design and are enrolled in the museum management and curatorship program, we are reviewing the options um, and the impacts for fall sports and recreation activities because we know that there are going to be a lot of impacts from COVID-19 this year. Um, and we are looking into return to sport plans. There is not going to be an athletic facility fee this year on your tuition for the fall, but we are working with our city partners at both the Peterborough Sport and Wellness Center and as well as the, the Lindsay Recreation Complex um, to look into month to month um, use of their facilities at an appropriate rate. For students that will be joining us in the fall, uh, the question being, when will their timetables be available? Wendy and Bailey? So I'll start off with this one. From an admission side of things, you won't receive your timetable until your full fees have been paid and until the conditions on your application have been lifted. So for anyone who received a conditional offer, or if you're not sure what your conditions are, or even if you have them, please email admissions at flemingcollege.ca and we'll help to provide you with exactly what you're going to need to lift those conditions. So that might be that we need your official high school transcripts or that we're waiting on a document from you before we can continue. Um, timetables are usually posted for the Sutherland programs in August, so we will be working towards that date and, and getting you timetables as soon as possible. Um, regarding your fees, if you haven't seen your fee notifications yet, once you've confirmed your offer, a fee notification will be automatically added to your student center. So you'll be able to see all of that through your student center. Um, and again, if you've got any questions about anything to get to the point of um, receiving a timetable and starting your classes, please email admissions or the ask us email and we are more than happy to help with those questions. For the Halliburton campus students, we usually send an information package um, with information about the campus, the programs, um, a number of community activities that you can be involved with, um, usually late July, early August. And in that, um, for most of the programs, there's a, it's, it's like a draft of your programs um, their, your timetable. So it gives you an idea of what is scheduled when and when you need lots of drawing supplies and when you need to use the computer more. Um, so um, those things will be coming out to you early August anyways. Um, and again, like Bailey said, if you have any questions, then contact us. Thank you, Wendy. Learning online will be a new experience for some people. Are there resources available to help students learn in an online environment? Wendy? I can't stress this enough. Go to the Student Life tab on the Fleming webpage and you will see lots of information there. There's information about the library and tutoring and academic skills and in partnership with the Accessible Education Services and the Learning Design and Support Team, it developed a new online resource for students. It covers all facets of learning online. This web module will help you navigate the essential skills, the strategies, and the resources that you need to thrive in an online learning environment. It includes how to set up your study place, 
and how to navigate D2L. We use that a lot. How to connect with a tutor, how to deliver a great online presentation, and there's much more. Just go to that um, under more applications in the student portal through the library website. And I can't stress it enough, go to your student life tab and just explore in there. You'll find all kinds of great information that will help you. Thank you, Wendy. And what counseling, wellness, and mental health supports are available for students? So for health services, once you're in Halliburton, we have a hospital and we have um, doctors and nurses. Um, it's small, but you can get some support there if you need it. As far as the counseling, wellness, and mental health, we have counselors that will be available to you by email, by phone, or by video conference. For students who need to talk with someone about issues that impact their academic success, personal wellness counselors are available as well. They're available directly by phone for faculty or students by calling 705-749-5530, extension 1440. You can find that information on our website as well. There's also on Fleming's website, a how are you? And it's our main navigation, taking you to a personal wellness support page that has resources and links to many services. There's also in Halliburton, a youth wellness hub. And if you are under the age of 25, you can connect with them as well. And they have personal counselors as well. Thank you, Wendy. And how will students access accessible education supports? Okay, so if you have a documented medical, physical, psychological, or learning disability, so if you had an IEP in high school, it doesn't follow you here. You have to send it to us. And you may be eligible for accommodations that will help you succeed academically. You can visit our website under the Accessible Education Services Department, and it will give you lots of information there about what you need and how to connect with a counselor. You can make an appointment by contacting the receptionist, Jennifer Beauchamp. Her information is linked on there as well. Um, you can email her or you can call, and all that information is there on our website. We have a First at Fleming, which is a summer transition program. And I believe that is more for the Peterborough campus, but you can still connect in. If you're a Fleming student, you are a Fleming student. And they'll be offering one day information, virtual experiences for all students registered for the, we call it AES, the Accessible Education Services on September 1st. The focus will be on how to successfully transition from high school to post-secondary, because there are differences. For more information, you can contact Jennifer. And if you can't find that information, you can contact me and I can put you in touch with her. Great, thank you, Wendy. Wendy, you did speak a little bit about uh, health services in uh, Halliburton, but there we should perhaps mention uh, along your line of a student as a student, there are specific health services available also at the Peterborough and Lindsay campuses with specific contact information, and that will be available uh, online as well. Will there be tutoring available? Yes, we figured out how to do tutoring online as well. Uh, so, with the tutoring and learning strategies, so that's lots of things like study skills, time management, trying to organize yourself, all of those things are available for students, and they'll be available through WebEx, very much like this. You can book online using WC Online, or email Kathleen Conway, and, or Laura Gibson, and their information will be on the website as well, under the tutoring services. Or again, you can contact me, and I can put you in the link with them. Great, thanks so much. Angela, what supports are in place for Indigenous student services for students who identify as First Nations, status, non-status, Métis, and Inuit? Well, we do an amazing job here at Fem Fleming College in supporting all of our Indigenous uh, students. And there is much available in terms of um, 
uh, services such as one on one um, mentoring and um, any any kind of questions or concerns that you might have. You can email um, the services or you can WebEx set up an appointment and have a WebEx um, meeting. Um, you can also phone them directly. There is transitional support, which is so important um, because it's, it's for all of our students. It's a major change to, to leave home um, and come to school or to return to school as a mature student. So there's transitional support. There are um, cultural workshops and resources. There are access to elders um, and traditional knowledge holders. There's advocacy and referrals to services on and off campus, and there are drop-in sessions available on WebEx on a regular basis. So I think that to anything that you need, any kinds of supports you need, it's as for all students, it's a matter of asking. There is so much um, work and effort done behind the scenes to support student success throughout your academic career. Thank you, Angela. On a very practical uh, side and sense, how will students uh, know what they need to do before classes start in the fall? Bailey and Wendy? Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, your fee notifications will be posted on your student center and you're also going to receive an email about those. If you have any questions, you can email admissions or our student accounts team, which is students dot accounts at FlemingCollege.ca. Um, there is going to be an online orientation event for students who attend in the fall. This is for the Sutherland campus and more details will come out and be sent to you later in the summer. For those of you who, uh, where this is your first post-secondary experience, we will be hosting an online welcome days in the week of July 13th. So we will be working on that. It's going to be held online virtually. This is a great opportunity to ask any questions you have about the campus. Um, generally, there's an opportunity to speak to some of your faculty. Um, it might look a little bit different this year, and I encourage everyone to attend that um, once the information becomes available to you, whether this is your first time at college or your 10th time at college. I think it's a really great opportunity. So if you've got any questions about what you need to do, um, hopefully the welcome days and the orientation information will be out to you soon, and that'll be your best resource. For Halliburton campus students, we plan to have an orientation as well. Um, it will look a little bit differently than it normally does, but it still will be a welcome to you. And again, the packages will go out early August and it will have vast information that will help you prepare for your classes, um, right down to um, if you need a ruler or not. Uh, for any of the students that are requiring um, special material, We'll be sending that material to you so that you don't have to worry about a huge list to go out and find. Um, those things will be sent directly to you so that you will be very well prepared for your classes. And for orientation, we're hoping to join in virtually something like this so that you can meet um, your faculty, your coordinators, and get to feel comfortable that you're part of our family here. Thank you, Wendy. Bailey, did you want to um, give a, a brief overview of some of the changes to the OSAP program? Absolutely. So for any students who are receiving OSAP this year or who are interested in receiving OSAP, um, you can go to osap.gov.on.ca for more information. Um, so new this year, all students have to complete an online information session. So this hasn't happened before. Once you've gone through and created your profile, you will have to go through a series of pages with, um, which is all the details about OSAP and your financial information. And there's some randomized questions that you're going to have to answer in order to move forward in the application process. So a lot of these changes have been brought in since COVID-19 um, with an attempt to kind of smooth out the process for everyone. There's some also, there are also some differences in the OSAP needs assessment. So there's provincial and federal funding available through OSAP. So the loan limit has increased this year up to $350 per week. Um, the Canada study grant um, 
has been doubled this year for eligible students, uh, both full and part-time, and as well as for students with permanent disabilities or students with dependents. So we do have a lot of mature students um, who do have dependents, and we are very much um, wanting to be able to help support you through this because we know this is a bit of a challenge, um, especially as most of you will be homeschooling as well, um, at least until now, or at least through the rest of the spring, and then it'll be a bit of a change when everyone goes back to school in the fall. Um, for anyone who does not wish to identify or disclose their gender identity, there is now an other option. Um, so you are no longer required to disclose your gender on your OSAP application. Um, all communications from now on with OSAP are going to be online. So it used to be a lot of paper going back and forth. So that has been changed as well. And there's also another change with the permanent disability documentation. So you can actually have your funding released now before your documentation has been approved, which will hopefully smooth out um, the process for everything else. So that's those are most of the large changes to OSAP this year. Um, there's also a couple changes if you um, are being supported by the Children's Aid Society, um, if you have foreign income as well. So all of that can be found on the OSAP website, um, or if you have any uh, any questions, you can email our financial aid team at fin, F-I-N, aid, A-I-D, at flemingcollege.ca. Thanks, Billy. That's, uh, that's important information, and I'm sure of great interest. The delivery format of programs at the Halliburton campus with our certificates and our diplomas is quite unique and often inspires the question around how do the certificates and the diplomas work together or how do they stand alone? Um, I wonder if we might ask Barr to help us with, uh, with that question. Okay, well, um, the uh, diplomas are what are called two-year diplomas. Uh, and what they consist of is two semesters in either uh, integrated design or visual creative arts diploma or VCAT, um, and then one semester in a certificate. So in order to complete your diploma, you have to do two semesters in the diploma program and one semester in a certificate. And the certificates are what are called uh, one-year uh, Ontario certificates um, in the various um, uh, mediums, so ceramics, fiber arts, um, in painting, photo arts, uh, artist blacksmithing, digital image design, moving image design. Um, have I left anything out? I hope not. Um, anyway, um, so the certificates are either offered in the fall semester or in the winter semester. Um, so uh, you can decide to do it two different ways. You can you can do two semesters in integrated design or VCAD, uh, and then do your certificate, or you can take your certificate first and then go into the diploma program. Obviously, uh, we would prefer you to go the, the first way um, to do the diploma uh, programs first, because then you get a grounding in both fine art uh, or design or both. And um, that, that gives you the, um, the foundation that you can take into the certificate programs and um, uh, create, uh, we hope, more meaningful work. Um, but that's not to say that you can't do it the other way around. So the idea is that um, you take a certificate um, or you take a diploma program or you can do both. Um, we have one student who did every single certificate and every single uh, diploma uh, at the school. It took her seven years. Um, but she's legendary. That's uh, Kelsey Redmond. Um, but yeah, like I mean, I think once you get here, you're kind of hooked, and um, and you want to live here for the rest of your life. So um, it's a great place to be. And um, yeah, so that, that's what it is. The accelerated is really meaning that that um, you're here every day, all day, from you know nine to four. 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. Um, and that's why it's accelerated because in, in other institutions, you know, you might get one course um, one day every week for 14 weeks. Um, but here, everything's a little bit more compressed. Um, and that's mainly due to the fact that we bring in um, 
professional artists and designers from all over the country and um and you know they they have to travel here to get here so we want to give them sort of the opportunity to give you a, an intense learning experience so um so that's why it's, it's accelerated hopefully that makes any sense it makes great sense, Barb. Thank you. And it's true, you know, a number of our students have taken more than one certificate because it's such a great community that they're here and they're reluctant to leave. So they, they choose another certificate and spend another semester with us. We're approaching the end of the session, but I have one more question and it's for you, Barb. What's the difference between art and design? <laughs> um, well, I always say that, that um, art is about risk taking and uh, design is about risk management. Um, that's, that's a pretty simple way of thinking about it, but I think um, both are pretty integrated. And I think with the craft studios, even more integrated. Um, because, uh, you know, both in art and design, we're, we're concerned with material culture and issues around sustainability. Um, and it's about, it's about making things, right? It's about, uh, about aesthetics and understanding what aesthetics are and style um, and utility. So, you know, I often think about design as sort of the marriage between aesthetics and utility. Um, yeah, so if, if I was going to simplify what the difference between art and design is, I would say that you know, art is about risk taking because you know, you may or may not necessarily have a client in mind. It's about it's about an expression of an idea or that concept. Um, is that an alarm? Am I out of time? <laughs> um, but usually in design, uh, you 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 have a client, and um, and you're working with um, deadlines and budgets, and um, there's there's different types of constraints on design um, than there are on art but I think uh, both are valuable and both can speak to each other in a really meaningful way. Great explanation, thanks so much. And this does conclude our session today. I want to thank all of you who participated with us. And I certainly want to thank the panelists. Some really good information shared here today. And we look forward to continuing to help with questions. Don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, there's lots of contact information on our website, hsad.ca, and you can email us at Ask us, A S K U S at sad.ca. Thank you very much.